This is a joyful week. It is, uh, I think, for both Narita and I, uh, we're, we're happily surprised at the connections. But that shouldn't surprise us because we're connecting with the people of God. And there is a common bond that connects the people of God, regardless where we're at on the journey, regardless where, even where we're at denominationally. The common bond is not the uniformity of our dress or anything like that. It is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And so we put radical trust. Uh, did you ever stop and think that Christianity is the only world religion that puts its radical trust into a living God? And that living God, incarnate in Jesus Christ, living in his believers today in the person of the Holy Spirit, c- creates a connection that makes what Darren said last night. We're experiencing a little bit of heaven here, and the more we can keep that in mind as we move forward, the better off we are. Let me take care of two housekeeping items. If you're interested in books, I've been overwhelmed by the response. Uh, Sometimes I pinch myself about all that, but uh, they're available back there for $20. If you don't have 20 bucks, take it. Um, send it to me, and my wife and I will just go hungry on the way home. No, just kidding. <laughs> also, I had promised yesterday about the PowerPoint. I'll make that available, and we were discussing what the best way is to do that. Um, I am going to email, or, or I'm going to get Roche. Roche, stand, please. Roche is back at the Rosedale table. Um, I'm going to get her a copy of that and then she can distribute it to whoever wishes. So you reach out to her for that. And for, especially for you Ohio people, but even broader, let us know how Behalt, the Amish Mennonite Heritage Center, can serve your church. If you want to visit or anything like that, let us know how we can help. I'd also just like to say a few words. There are so many people in my life who I owe so much to. Um, I've I've had such good mentors and historians at institutions and outside of those places, Walter Beachy, these people who first spurred that love and cultivated it. But I wouldn't be here this morning without my wife. Literally, uh, in 2008, I I had spinal meningitis and encephalitis that was really hard to detect, nearly died. The the hospitals tried to kill me. Sorry, (laughs) that's a terrible way to say it. But my wife saved my life. Like, she fought for me in a way that honors Jesus, that reflects Jesus. She fought with the, she kept saying, no, I'm not taking him home. We have to figure out what's wrong. She saved my life. Uh, I would probably, um, uh, only 25% of people survive with what I had. And of that 25%, 75 have permanent brain damage. Uh, 75%, so I, am, I have a little bit, I have, I have some th- issues to deal with, uh, which also makes it more difficult for me to remember your names when I meet you next time, and some memory issues. But, uh, but here is the other joyful part of our marriage. She also graduated cum laude from Ohio State. She has a master's degree from Yale University uh, in the history of Christianity, focused on, on the space of Anabaptist women and, in the movement. Um, is she, here now? she is. Right? Stand. Can you stand? Okay. She waved. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, we broke some ceilings in our circles, but more than me, she, in, in our circles, the conservative men circles that we moved and worked in, I know of no other married conservative woman, pastor's wife, who followed her husband or, or actually wanted to go to school in a strange pursuit. So two historians living in the same house with a dog. And the, the dog knows more history than some of you do, but anyway, or has heard, has heard more history. Uh, that's a bit of our journey. Uh, so we're both academics, and, and I respect and honor my wife for her space and, and her role. And if you want to know more about Anabaptist women, you want a, a speaker for that, uh, that she is uh, adept at telling you some stories of things that you might not know. 
join with me in thinking through uh, so a little bit of follow-up from yesterday. This is the early Anabaptist. This is from the Behalt mural. Uh, the early Anabaptist studying, by the way, Behalt mural. Some of you don't know what it is. It's a painting 10 feet high, 265 feet in length that tells a story from Jesus to the modern day of our people. We see people from every year from 100 nations, all 50 states and all the Canadian provinces every year. In the, in the 11 years that I've been there, of the 100, roughly 195 countries of the world, we have had visitors who've done the tour from 187 of those 195 countries. God in his providence smiled down at his people and said, you're not doing quite good enough at taking all the nation, taking the gospel of all the nations, so I'm going to bring all the nations to you. And that's a beautiful thing. So tourism is a really good thing at spreading the gospel. It's in Berlin, Ohio, near Berlin, Ohio, Holmes County, um, and it is open six days a week. Uh, tours are at the top of each hour, uh, and, but we also do extended tours. Uh, I told you yesterday we're doing the Amish, uh, those who are joining church. By the way, the Amish double in number every 20, roughly 21 and a half years. Um, the Amish population doubles. Their retention rate at keeping their young people in the old order Amish, the groups that we're most associated with in Holmes County, are at about 78% of their young people end up in the church of their, of their parents. And let me tell you something. We were telling redemption stories last night. Let me tell you a redemption story. In the last 30 years, God has worked a miracle in my Holmes County Amish community among my people in a way that is so spectacularly God. It begins organically. As younger men move into leadership and they begin to ask questions. And they begin to say, well, we can't, all, we can't just do what we've always done. We need to actually think about what is our traditions. And they're really good at answering questions. Like people ask them, why do you wear those funny pants? They say, well, I'm not wearing funny pants. You guys are wearing, whoever thought of putting, <laughs> whoever thought of putting zippers in pants. Anyway, they say, well, you know what? It's cultural. It's cultural, simply cultural. It's okay. There's no Bible verse about these pants. It's cultural. But everyone makes choices to live in culture, so when we're Amish, we, you choose this culture. That's a good answer. That's a better answer than trying to find a Bible verse that doesn't fit. <laughs> and, and so what, they've been, what that has allowed them to do is kind of create a space for the movement of the Spirit built around those living traditions that has changed the church. And so I have these deep spiritual discussions with my Amish brothers and sisters. And it extends across most of the Amish spectrum in Holmes County, except for maybe the Swartz and Trooper, who are the more, most conservative groups. And even there, you're beginning to hear bits and pieces of it. So, bless God. That's his story. Yeah. Uh, no, these are the Anabaptists. The guy on the right is, uh, is uh, Grebel, and then the others are, are various parts of that first group of 20. So I want to I just return one thing somebody asked me yesterday. Why were they willing to die on the hill of infant baptism? It's, it, that's a really good question. It, and infant baptism, both Zwingli and Luther and the Catholic Church could not envision a world where, this, where the church and the state were separated. And so when a child was born in that world, it was baptized at eight days old, which made it a citizen of the state and a member of the church, liable for taxes and tithes. And so when the Anabaptists come along and say, only those who are adult and can make a voluntary decision to follow Jesus should be baptized, it, what it's doing is it is messing with the authority of the state. And so it is, it is much bigger than just baptism. It's about the nature of the church and the state and that deep connection. And they're breaking that connection saying they're 200 years ahead of their time at saying the church and the state should be separate. The second question someone asked me yesterday is, um, is uh, about their view of scripture. So they are not uh, hard fundamentalist in their view of scripture, early Anabaptists. They're very adept, some of them, with Scripture. They tend, though, to focus on the Gospels. They, they make statements like, uh, the rest of Scripture is subservient to the Gospels, which is a good lesson for us. 
The life of Jesus informs the scriptures. So without the, and they would make arguments that without the living word within you, you cannot read the written word. So the living word, Jesus Christ, lives within his people, and through that, we interpret scripture. Uh, someone also asked me about the focus on Zurich, and what did it, was it starting in other places? Yes, it was, actually. Zurich is the one we know the best, these people, Mons, Grebel, and Blarock, but it is also, it's popping up over Europe uh, very organically. Out of peasant wars and so on, people beginning to question the authority of the state. So it, 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 it's not just Zurich, although this is the story we know best. So this morning, I'd like to just do, uh, I'd like to look at a piece of scripture. Remember I told you yesterday, uh, this is John the baptizer, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, your mother is a snake, or you brood of vipers, uh, you're a generation of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with re repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Do not presume to say to yourself, we have Menno as our father. Amen. Or the Zurich group as our fathers. For I tell you, God is able from these stones, where was John the baptizer baptizing? Where they crossed the Jordan River, where the pile of stones was. To, to raise up children for Abraham, to replace Abraham's children. The minute we move into the space where we take pride and, and, and we begin to kind of say, well, look who we are. And, and we do that in multiple ways in our worlds when we, when we think that we're the truest way to live out Christianity. This is our way to live out Christianity, where God has called us in the ecology of the kingdom. There are many ways to live out Christianity. And we bless those people around us who are living differently. As long as, we, I have to be careful how I say this, when we can connect around Jesus, that's when, that is the centerpiece. I want, I want to move forward, and I had to show you this picture of Munster. Did I not? I want to move to this broken Dutch priest who in the 1530s finally begins to read scripture. Now many people think of Menno as this fussy old man. You should read Menno. I, I love giving this uh, paragraph about Menno. Menno was accused of drinking wine too liberally and eating roasted meat. In our world that doesn't make sense, but peasants in that world, there were sumptuary laws in Europe. And these sumptuary laws said peasants could only eat seethed meat, meat cooked in water. That's the poorer portions of meat. They're poor people. They shouldn't eat roasted meat. And they only drank beer. Not many people drank water because the water was so unsanitary. And so they, they would drink weak beer. So apparently there were detractors within the church who said, Menno is living quite liberally. He's eating roasted meat and drinking wine instead of beer. And he says, if I get the chance to eat roasted meat and drink wine, I'm going to. <laughs> I, you don't know that about Menno, did you? Okay. He's a cool guy. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting anything about alcohol or anything here. I'm just saying that, that they're not fussy old people. They're people living in their cultural context who care deeply about the gospel. And about, they care deeply about the person of Jesus. And as Menno begins to read the scriptures, it, his heart becomes alive and then Munster happens and it awakens him. It's, it is thought, that most likely, so there's a group of about 300 Anabaptists that were moving towards Munster and got stuck in the old, in an old uh, former uh, uh, Catholic cloister and were captured there by the bishop's forces. And it is likely that Menno's brother Peter was a part of that group and was beheaded. And it kind of awakened Menno. And through the horribleness of Munster, isn't that God's redeeming power? That through something so terrible as Munster, this man awakens to reading the scriptures. And Menno begins to read the scriptures. And he becomes this person. He becomes the person who ties the church together. There was such a high price on his head. Um, it was actually illegal. It was a capital crime to give Menno a place to sleep, or a meal to eat. He was such a prominent leader. There is a, an account of a man being beheaded in the martyr's mirror because he gave Menno a meal. Wasn't even an Anabaptist himself. 
And one of the queens of the region began to call his followers Meno, Meno's Light, Meno's People, and then Mennonists, and then Mennonites. Now, Meno would turn over in his grave if he knew a whole group of people had his name. <laughs> he wasn't that kind of guy. He wasn't looking to build a legacy. He was looking to build something living, Jesus Christ in his people. And as Menno began to read the scriptures, this became Menno's life. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building on it. Let each one of you, let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This became Menno's most quoted piece of scripture in his writings. He believes that there is one foundation. Many people can build on it. And in today's world, we need to back up and say, the foundation is Jesus, and all of us are called to build on that foundation, regardless who we are, whether we're Mennonite, whether we're Amish. We, we build the kingdom where we are, or Lutheran, or Methodist, or Catholic, or anyone else. It is, it is fascinating that he uses this idea, Paul uses this idea of a foundation. And then he, says, he goes on and says, you build on it, gold, silver, hay, and stubble, and then it'll be tried. That is actually speaking to us leaders, that we, we recognize the fact that there is a foundation that is laid. You and I don't have to lay the foundation. The foundation is laid, it is Jesus. It is his life, his, his, life, his death, his, his actually, his Entrance into the world in the incarnation, his life, his death, and his resurrection. You know, I put emphasis on life because the, Earth, the Anabaptists, we have traditionally and historically believed that we follow after Jesus. We live like he lived, not in the same cultural context, but we live as he lived at giving to the world unselfish love. I'd like to turn to a, another story. I, I should tell you that the mural at uh, Behold was painted by a man named Heinz Goggle. Heinz is a fascinating man. He was born in the 1930s in southern Germany, Schwabia. And uh, at 17 years of age, he was drafted into Hitler's army. And at the Battle of the Bulge, he's a foot soldier, and he gets shot in the shoulder. He's laying in the snow in the forest of the Ardennes with this terrible wound in his shoulder. And as he's laying there, he decides that war does not solve humanity's problems. <laughs> you know, many people who have experienced the horrors of war understand that very well. And Heinz decides to work at bringing peace to the world. He's an artist. He moves to Canada after. He's, he's actually rescued by some American army officers, spends some time in a POW hospital, moves to Canada after the war. In the late 1960s, he was driving to Columbus, Ohio, to look at some glazed brick. By the way, he never had an art lesson in his life. I love this about him. He said, uh, why have, take lessons if you can do it? And, uh, <laughs> and, he, um, and he stopped at Berlin and ate at one of the restaurants in Berlin, walked outside, and heard somebody speaking Pennsylvania Dutch and could understand it and decided to come, and he was taken. He was particularly taken by the Amish and Mennonites, our position at, on peace. And so in the mural, there are these pieces that speak so powerfully to our broken world, our world who has all these labels. Last night, Darren did such an able job. He had uh, courage to list that list. Get courage. Bless you, brother. You have the Trumps and anything but Trumps. You have the woke and you have the deplorable, whatever, deplorable right, whatever. All these labels that we... The, the peace of Jesus speaks to those pieces of our world and says, bridge the gaps. When Heinz was painting the painting, he came across a story in the martyr's mirror that so deeply spoke to him uh, by the way, Heinz never joined the Amish and Mennonite. He was a non-practicing Catholic who struggled with alcohol all his life. And, you know, for years people said, oh, we don't even know if he ever made a commitment to Jesus. I don't know how you can do this without. So I'm not here to judge that. 
And he said, you tell the story whichever way you want, but when you talk about the mural, you always include this part of the story. You know the story, it's Dirk Willems. It's 1569 in a town in southern Holland. When an, a Mennonite preacher, by now they're known as Mennonists, a Mennonite preacher named Dirk Willems is put into prison for his faith. He's a thin light man, um, made even more so by his term in prison. And one day, he has the opportunity to escape. And he runs away. Now think, oh, freedom. Get me out of here. He has a wife and children, by the way. We know that much. And he's running away. But he's seeing, there's, still a, there's a bounty on Anabaptist's head. There's an entire group of people who are called Taifa Yago, Anabaptist hunters. And they saw him go. And he's being pursued by a group of men with one man kind of in the lead. And Dirk runs across a canal. It's late winter. Dirk runs across a canal that has thin ice. And because he's thin and light, he makes it across. His pursuer, weighed down with the good life, falls through the ice. Now Dirk has an opportunity. He has an opportunity to get away. But he hears his pursuer fall through the ice. And he stops. And he turns back. And he helps his pursuer out of the ice. His pursuer wanted to let him go, but his colleagues on the other shore said, absolutely not. It's your life or his. Dirk was chained to a soldier, put back into prison, and two and a half weeks later, was burned at the stake. I wonder how often, in those two and a half weeks, Dirk thought, should I have stopped? Don't, don't make these people superhumans. They're people like you and me. Did I do the right thing? And, and think about the morning he was led out to be burned at the stake. The awareness that he has a wife and children. And he dies. With no awareness that his story would ever be told. The choice that Dirk made that morning didn't happen that morning. It happened long before that. Because you don't make a choice like that when it's, you don't, it, it came out of his life. And his life reflected something that reflects Jesus' life. It is better to give life than to take life. And if it means giving my life, that's what I'll do. And we have told that story to probably well over a million people who have visited Behalt over the last 30 years. I'll tell you several responses. This is a story that pulls more response than any other story because it's so unusual. A couple of years ago, we had a group of Jewish rabbis visit the center. From Jerusalem! And we run the tours at the top of the hour, so we had no clue who would be with them. And we noticed a group of Middle Eastern-looking people with them. They were Arabs from Gaza. They're in the mural hall together. A group of Jewish rabbis and a group of settlers from the Gaza Strip in the mural hall together. And at the end of the tour, one of the Jewish rabbis said, I suppose if we could get along in a space like this, we should think about getting along at home. We don't know what happened. Um, four years ago now, one of my good friends from Lancaster County, Elam Lapp, who's an Amish minister there, reached out to me and said, it's not fair that the Holmes County Amish young people get to do this, and the Lancaster young people don't. I said, well, bring your young people. So he filled up two buses. And we had 100 Lancaster County Amish young people visit the center. Now, when they visit the center, they're not like you. They're not looking at the clock all the time. They're used to a little longer church services. Anyway, um, so they wanted a three-hour tour. And uh, we're, we take, this is halfway. So we often, when we have a three-hour tour, we take a short break after this. And I... Uh, several of us tour guides do this together. And uh, I came to the story of Dirk Willems, and I noticed this 
young Amish girl, 18 to 20 probably. I, I remember how she looked. She had a purple dress on. And in Lancaster, they wear black, long black aprons and their heart-shaped coverings. And she was, she was beautiful. She stood kind of in the front about from here to Keith. When I told the story of Turk Phillips, she broke down. And you're... Your brain does a strange thing. I'm like, what, what did I say? What, what didn't I say? Is it that bad? Or what? And we took a break. And I also noticed that a few other of the young people kind of, there's a central post. They went in behind the post. A few of her friends came up, put their hands on her shoulder. We took the break, and Elam walked up to me, and Elam's a big man. I always laugh and say, you wear four-by-four four pants. Four feet long, and when the barn doors are out, four feet wide. Anyway, uh, he's a wonderful man who loves Jesus. He came up and put his hands on my shoulders and said, Marcus, do you know who that girl is? No. He said, remember in 2006, the Nickel Mine school shootings? Charlie Roberts, local West Nickel Mines man, a milk truck driver, Sna something snapped in Charlie. And he broke into an Amish schoolhouse, chased all the little boys out, and with a shotgun and a pistol, shot five, ten little girls. Five of them died. And this is one of the survivors. She has bullet scars in her body. And about three weeks after that occasion, The news media got a hold of the fact that the Amish family, uh, Charlie then killed himself. The news media received word that an Amish family had invited the Roberts family to their home for a meal and was offering them forgiveness. This is the Amish family that offered the Roberts family the forgiveness. And the story that her father used to convince his children that they could not live with the heavy load of bitterness and anger was the story of Dirk Willems. Dirk went to his death not knowing that 465 years later he'd be talked about. But he made a choice to follow Jesus in the past, the present, and the future. I asked, Elam asked me, I see Elam several times a year. I just saw him last weekend, and he said, are, are you still telling the story? I said, we are, Elam. And I said, let me just go through the, I'm going to use it this week. Let me just go through the story. He said, that's how it happened. The power of Jesus in love and forgiveness. One other short story. Early in my time there, I go in and check the, Often after tours, I go in and check. I don't give near all the tours. In fact, I don't give many of the daily tours. I went in and noticed a Muslim family. Now, obviously Muslim. She was wearing a, a... Most of her face was covered. You could see her eyes. And um, she was standing right in front of Dirk Willems. I was probably guilty of profiling. And I, I watched, and she, she stood there. And I kind of sidled up to her, and finally I said, is everything okay? And she said... She, she looked at me, which is so unusual for a Muslim woman, to look right in my face, and she said... She had these penetrating eyes. She said, is that story true? And I said, to our knowledge, it is. And she called her son and husband over, who were at another part, and she said, if there are Christians like this in the world, maybe we could follow Jesus. She said, and she begins to tell her story. She is from northern Iraq. And in the first desert storm, she heard George Bush on television talking about how, and God bless George Bush, you know, how this is a just war, a holy war, a war to take back. And she saw American airmen paint God bless America on their bombs, and one of those bombs fell on her village. And she is the only living member of her entire extended family. It killed all the others. She pointed back to the picture of the Crusades, and she said, my people know of Christians who paint crosses on their shields and banners and fight in the name of Jesus. We don't know this kind of Christianity. We could follow this kind of Christianity. 
So when we think about our living traditions, the place, the ecology of the kingdom that we've been a part of, this is uh, the biggest part. We offer the world an answer. The brokenness of our world an answer, Christianity does. I'm not going to spend much time here, but again, I ask you to think about, examine our traditions and identify the valuable and essential. Then you evaluate the current challenges to truth in our world and untangle our responses. How should we respond to the mess of our world, the labeling of our world? And then we create a framework for taking Jesus into that, those spaces. And don't forget. See, I, I'm a good, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I've taught a number of years, college and high school, and I know that if you hear it twice, it helps. Wisdom comes to the people of God through the moving of the Spirit. And it also comes through the cultural context we live in. We don't live in 1500 Zurich. We live in 21st century America with its unique challenges and spaces. How will we respond to those places? And then we, we look at our living traditions and say, what works to, for the kingdom of Jesus to be furthered in this space? The power of gospel is this. We should ask ourselves a question. How do we bring the power of the gospel to bear on the issues of this world? Ask, you know, all this. Uh, he, he read the list last night. Say, how, does it, how does the power of the gospel change that? And then you say, how do I bring the kingdom of heaven to earth? See, Anabaptists were primarily all millennials. Which means nothing to most of us, right? <laughs> because they believed, they, they said, Jesus is coming back. We just don't know when. But until then, the kingdom of God is on earth. That's all we know. That's the present reality we live in. So we live in the kingdom of God on earth right now. And it is our call to expand that kingdom. So how do we bring the kingdom of heaven to earth? I like what Darren said. What we are living in today should be a reflection, a small reflection, but a reflection of what is to come in heaven. And then how do we live well in the present world? Salvation is inseparable. Uh, these are the three points. The essence of Christianity is discipleship, the local voluntary gathered of Christ as at the heart of spreading the gospel, and the gospel of peace is the essence of good news. Jesus is concerned about bringing peace to the world. He is the prince of peace. And we do that primarily organically by connecting with your neighbors, your students, your people, and, and bringing peace to them. I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite verses. By the way, you want a good sermon? Sometime preach to your people from Hebrews 13. It, uh, it says, remember your leaders. And a little later it says, obey your leaders. <laughs> uh, look at it. But we often kind of pick out verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday to forever. But let's not disconnect it. Remember your leaders. The people sitting here. Those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Woo, stop. Your people are supposed to live like you do. That's scary. <laughs> or weighty. Weighty. But then he backs up and says, there is one leader that will not change. I love this verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The foundation we can build on. He is present in the past. He is present in our space today. And he will be present in the future. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a person. It is him. May I pray for you and for me? Lord Jesus, as we, uh, as leaders, as people who are called to, to speak the word of God, to speak into people's lives, May the strength of the true foundation be our space. May we build on that. 
And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help us reflect on the stories of how you've worked in the past. You were in that jail cell in Aspirin in 1569 with Dirk Willems. The dark places that we walk through as leaders, the spaces where we, we, we don't know the outcomes and we, we wrestle with, where are you in all of this? They're real spaces. And sometimes there are prisons. And I pray that you would move into those spaces and make us aware of your presence, your power, and your protection. And help us to move with courage to bring life into the world, to bring hope and peace into the world. Make us the kind of people that our people look at and say, they're disciples of Jesus. I want to be like them. And then give us the courage to speak the truth with love into this broken world. Lord Jesus, thank you that ultimately our identity is in you. And so we bless you for your power in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen.